Welcome back. That was a great panel. We just had a wonderful half hour listening to people ex with extreme heartfeltness and uh, and strength of what they're doing in the world, looking at uh, mus mental health in music and the music communities broadly defined, lots of geographies, lots of positive steps, and a lot of hearts at the end. I, I bring to you other hearts in this session. So um, I'm, I'm very excited here that we have a wonderful panel that is talking about uh, music in civic and emotional recovery. And I'm here to introduce Mira McLaughlin from Music Portland, who I'm always messing up and putting a space in between, but Music Portland, um, who will kick us off this really great panel to talk about almost the flip side of it, how music will help in our recovery. Take it away. Thank you. Yes, we had a, an advance call and we're gonna be hard pressed to pack all of our ideas and thoughts and hearts um, into a short span. But so I wanna jump right in and have everybody introduce themselves. And then we will dive in to talk about the many ways that music can be um, a real source of emotional recovery. So please, why don't we start with Shannon? Hi there, thank you, glad to be here today. Um, my name is Shannon Doubt and I'm the manager of cultural affairs for the city of Santa Monica in uh, California. Ken. Hi, um, I'm Ken and I'm an, um, I've been organizing concerts um, since the early 2000s. I've been running music venues and cultural venues in uh, Europe, obviously, um, for the last 15 years. And a year ago, I started as my own consultancy business uh, advising um, cultural organizations and venues on how to uh, do what they do best. Excellent. Laura. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Hutzlis. Uh, I've been in the music industry for 20 years now. I run an agency called Flight View Entertainment. And previous to that, I was a talent agent for many musicians at CAA. Uh, and my passion is mental health. Um, I serve as the president of the Onsite Foundation uh, which is an organization that provides trauma-informed counseling and wellness uh, education to individuals in underserved communities. And one of those communities is artist and the creative uh, community. Um, so that's why I'm here. Excellent. And I will, I will do a little bit of background on myself. I am thrilled to be with this august panel. I run Music Portland, which is a industry advocacy group and charitable organization for specifically independent music in Portland, Oregon. And we are in a particular moment having had an internationally acknowledged and viewed um, reckoning with our own challenging social and, and justice um, inequity problems. So um, it's interesting because I hear a lot of stuff from city government saying, we need, to, we need music to rebrand Portland. And it's not, it's a reimagining Portland. And that's, I think, a challenge that music is uniquely um, positioned to step up to. And I think that kind of brings in what a lot of these folks are doing specifically and that Portland is gonna need to learn from as we navigate a difficult transition. So um, I'll start it off. I know that, you know, from a civic engagement in our city, um, you know, we definitely, there's been a spike all across the country on social isolation and the kind of mental health problems and addiction problems that come with that. And, you know, we're also using the moment to look at all ages access to culture, you know, youth access to culture or in access to culture only compounds already the challenges of young people navigating increasingly stressful situations. So I know Laura, maybe you wanna leap off of that and then let's just go from there. I don't wanna lead this because everybody's got thoughts. Awesome. Um, well, so the Onsite Foundation works with communities, uh, specifically underserved communities uh, to help them process trauma. Um, and so some of those include survivors of sex trafficking, survivors of mass shootings, first responders, military. So all people who have been through tremendous traumas. Mm -hmm. We as a country have been through a tremendous trauma. And what I find interesting is part of the workshops that we do with these groups includes music. And we do a songwriting workshop. And it is always the most highly requested workshop 
Um, and, and when I really stop to think about, it, I think, why is that? Why is music providing this emotional healing um, to these survivors, these trauma survivors? Um, and so I want to dive into that real quick. If you just give me two minutes to explain, because I think it's important. Um, so music reduces stress. It encourages relaxation. It calms the body. But why that's important is because when we go through trauma, um, you know, our flight or fight response is activated. Um, in order to process that trauma, we have to lower that flight or fight response. Too many times when we get in trauma, our amygdala overreacts, right? And so then we live in kind of this PTSD state where anything triggers us. And so I'm seeing that in the country right now, where little things that maybe wouldn't have um, escalated so quickly or quickly escalated mm -hmm. because everybody's flight or fight response is heightened right now. Mm -hmm. So music lowers that and music calms that and music will bring that down. So then we can actually respond. We can, we can process the emotional trauma, right? We can process those things and then our responses aren't quite as reactive. Um, and so when we take these survivors through the workshop, they're able to do a music workshop, they're, they're writing their songs and lyrics, and we're able to lower that. So then we can actually dive into the deeper trauma. So as that relates to our community and our country now is we've missed out on music. So we're all heightened right now and we haven't had anything to lower that. Um, and so I'm looking forward to music starting coming together again and people going to live events because that will really, I think really help the country connect and, and, um, and just calm uh, that response. Absolutely. Ken, I know you've got stuff directly related to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think two, two or three panels ago, um, earlier, there was, uh, uh, were people talking about, you know, how, when will we return to, to live music venues in full force with loads of people? Um, um, and I think that's, that's obviously a worry from a financial point of view and a business model's point of view. But I think there's a, a really interesting chance for these small venues, for these small uh, shows that we'll have to make do, you know, in the next couple of months and perhaps a year um, to just find out what it is again to meet people in a venue and to have the close connection and not just these mass events and like um, the, the arenas as the, the, the main goal, but like smaller intimate sessions. Um, and I think there's a, it, it, it's related to the um, people again. And I think that was, uh, if the pandemic has taught us one thing, it is that meeting people is crucial. We've missed that. We've missed that tremendously. And none of the live streamings in the world and none of the uh, online applications can actually uh, replace the, the physical closeness and togetherness of people. So I think that um, we will have to figure out new business models, but we will have a great time meeting each other again. So it's interesting to see the upsides of the post-pandemic world and all of the chaos that will uh, we will meet just at the end of the tunnel. So it's, it's interesting to see what will happen. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's, we're in such an interesting time because the past year has shown us how, um, how important the arts are to keeping us sane while we're in isolation. But we've also been able to participate in arts experiences because it's virtual in a way that we may not have been able to do before. So as we kind of think about what our, our new future that we want to envision is, um, is there a mix where, you know, the accessibility of art forms is um, taken with us? Um, but I really think that this, this sense of community, I think that people, people have gotten to know their community, um, their neighborhoods, a lot better. I know I have gotten to know my neighbors a lot better the last year. And so I feel a sense of um, connection to the community. And I really think that music um, will have an opportunity to really bring these micro communities kind of together in some ways and really deep and in strong ways. Um, and I just wanted to touch on uh, the program that we developed for, for the city It's called Art of Recovery. And it's to put artists to work um, to address our three recovery goals, uh, economic, public health, which includes mental health and racial justice. And so we've been doing um, projects all year and they're all public projects. 
but musicians haven't really been able to participate because anything that would create a gathering <laughs> was not allowed under the health order. Even having a guitarist at an outdoor dining venue wasn't allowed. And so really looking forward to kind of be, having an opportunity to kind of put into practice um, some different um, ideas that artists might have for how they want to work in their local communities or in their local neighborhoods. Yeah, I'm thinking about the 60s too, when, you know, there was this huge social upheaval and it really was very much music and the communities around music that that provided that unity and that sort of reckoning and that calming, like you say, Laura, that, um, that sort of processed that moment. And that's definitely what I'm feeling at this end is that we need those collective experiences that are somewhat ecstatic, you know, they, they, churches happened and were popular with people because you'd get there, you knew the same words, you sang the same songs, and it was this unifying thing. And Portland is one of the, the least church cities in the country. And this is what we have. We have, a, we have a vibrant music culture. And having been denied it, you know, it's, I felt, actually, Shannon, I'm glad to know you more connected. I feel way less connected. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people maybe do too, just the weird fear and vulnerability of your own body and their body is something that music can also intercept, you know, dancing together. Can you imagine? It's, you know, it's very exciting. We talked about this yesterday, but there's a term for that, right? Which is collective effervescence. And there's studies uh, that show that when, when people rally together around a common theme or a common action, that this collective effervescence exists. And it does date back to religion and early days of worship and really being centered in that. And what it does is create this unity. And what we know about working with trauma survivors is that you cannot off, you can only offload pain in community. You can't do it in isolation. So I think what I'm hearing is, you know, Shannon had her own community, it sounds like in the neighborhood that you're able to perhaps process some of that pain Others didn't have that community and weren't able to do that. And so there, there's people all over the world that are in different situations. And a lot of that depended upon their own comfort level of going out or not going out. And so everyone's in a different, different place. But I think what music can do this year is bring people together. We have vaccines now. We have things to keep us safe. So I think everyone's looking forward to now being in that experience, experience, experiencing that collective effervescence and processing that pain. I think that, that one of the interesting things of this, um, probably a very historic moment is the, the pandemic. Um, a very interesting thing is that um, we've also reached like an internet age. We always thought that we were in the internet age, but that was like last year, we weren't in that internet age. I mean, the, the if you talk about community and being connected, we've never been disconnected. I mean, uh, my, um, I've started Skyping with my parents like this year or last year, not not earlier than that, because that wasn't a, a habit we had. Now it's a habit. So um, it's interesting to to really focus on the being together physical as an aspect of um, um, of meeting people. You can meet people We're more connected than ever, but this being together in a, in a, in a, in one place is going to be crucial for the next uh, the next months and years. And I think that's a game changer. I think um, if you talk about um, feeling connection. I find myself talking to people in the shop when I just get something, uh, like a takeaway thing. I, I find myself talking to people endlessly because you need this like uh, um, improvised connection and like just this, this like the, the, the non-scripted thing. Um, and so I think that this will have changed our social interaction and it will have an impact on, I think the internet is, um, music will always be on the internet and more and more but this, this need to meet each other will always be there as well. And these two things, uh, they connect in an interesting way. But the physical aspect is, is totally new for me. It was, it's never been this clear that you need to be in the same place with people. Um, that's, that's very interesting. I liked, Ken, when we talked before, kind of, for me, this is interesting too, that, that leaning into local, you know, the fact that it isn't that it's a giant, for a while, definitely, it won't be that it's a giant star on the stage. It's the fact that you're there with, a bunch of people that like you love this star and that you know for music ecologies as they come back the idea that it is you know it's gonna be the community is even amplified when you uh when you focus on local artists yeah. because 
you're going to find them again in a month somewhere. Right. And then you can really build the connections with that community around that artist in a more consistent way. So I, I love that. Yeah, even even better. If, if There was the underlying assumption that the only way to be a real musician was to play local venues and then move on to the arenas and become a world star. And now we see that you can also have a career and a very valuable career as an artist who just plays local bars and uh, for local communities. And you can you can have a music venue that only has local local artists and still is a, a massively great music venue. You don't need that um, the world stage and you don't need the, the kind of the Netflix approach of having this huge audience where you broadcast to everybody. It has to be local as well. And th these are two different models. And it's very interesting to have them combined and to have uh, all kinds of things. So th there's niches that you can actually play to. And that's very interesting. Yeah. I think one oh. thing. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say one thing to, to mention here is, you know, a lot of uh, small live music venues where you would see those new artists or emerging acts have really suffered because of the pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, many of them have had to close their doors or have been bought out. Um, and so there is a wonderful um, website if you want to go to it at saveourstages.com. Um, and so there's ways that you can uh, perhaps make donations and save some of these venues that give those local artists a chance to play and a stage to play on, which I think is really important in, in uh, keeping the, the essence of, of music. Yeah. Yeah, and I was just going to add that I think in this between time when things aren't fully open yet, but things are more open, I think it'll be interesting. What we're hoping to do is to bring music into the public, to view music as public art, and which we've never done that before. Public art is usually a sculpture, right? And so what does music as public art do and how does it build community? So you have a, a musician in a local park putting on a maybe just a small scale acoustic concert um, and how that can help kind of not only connect and create community, but also to um, expand what we think about when we think about where music can be shown and where it can be experienced. And, um, and you know, I think, Ken, uh, some of your writing around this is a, you know, a moment for us to think about models. And in the nonprofit arts world, they often talk about getting outside of the four walls of the club to reach people where they are. And so what opportunities do we have now to, to do that while we can't yet bring everyone into um, a physical space together? Yeah, a lot of our policy advocacy is, and it's happening across the country. I've heard from folks in Nashville and things that are actually lobbying to create city policy and permitting rules that, you know, there are streeteries now that are, I think many of them are going to stick around where they've extended the borders of a restaurant. How do we extend the borders of a venue and engage people? And I think that connects again to the, to the all ages access. How do you, how do you extend the positive emotional impact of music by extending the boundaries of where it happens? So I am, I'm, I'm I'm hopeful that we'll see more of that across the country, particularly in places like California, where it's rarely cloudy. You know, um, we've only got that much time that it's not moist. Um, so, um, but yeah, it's, I think it, it, it's hopeful because I think there is a collective acknowledgement of the value and, um, you know, hopefully we can do it. And, you know, our bodies have been weaponized and made vulnerable for a year and, you know, I can't think of anything besides dance that allows us to forget that for a minute, you know, or moving in, you know, together in a wave of people. Those are, those are like biological things that happen. And it's, I think it's going to be so important to make sure that we position music at the table in everything, policy, mm -hmm. you know. But that is the, sorry. Nope. That's the paradigm shift that we talked about, right? If you, uh, and it's also the thing with underage um, um, uh, access to music. If you look at live music venues from a point of view uh, of policing um, uh, drinks and drugs and all of that, then, you know, you have to keep minors out. But if you look at it from a point of view of mental health and social, uh, so, uh, social work and meeting each other, then it's crucial that people... Uh, get to, to music venues and meet each other and, and enjoy music and dance together. So it's a different way of looking at things. And so you have to restructure your policies to actually do something about the 
enormous loneliness that people have been feeling in the last year, but also to, to socialize people, to, to, to make sure that we know how it works, how you, how you meet people, how you talk to people. And in nature where everybody's on their phone all the time, this social interaction face to face is very crucial. So I think that uh, a whole new world opens up when you look at it from that kind of policy. How do we teach people to meet each other physically? Um, and music can, can be the crucial uh, and central role in that. So I think that's very exciting. Yeah, there's a comment from somebody in the audience that's mentioning that they are in a community of faith. And I, you know, I certainly didn't mean to dismiss any of that because I think that those are core musical experiences too. And that, you know, they definitely give people a sense of connection. And, you know, in the same way that music performance isn't just about the band, I think church experience isn't just about the religious practice. It's about that community and that, and that audible shared voice. So yeah. it's a cool connection. Yeah, I think it goes right back to what I was saying about offloading pain in community. And you need vulnerability and you need safety to do that. And that's exactly what uh, faith, faith-based communities are. And I'm part of one myself. And there's a lot of healing there. There's a lot of accountability. There's a lot of support. And I think that's why, why people are drawn to it um, as well, because there, there is that. And yeah. so it, I mean, what every, almost every church starts with music. Yeah. Right. I don't think I've been to one that doesn't, doesn't start with worship. It's my favorite part. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, one great part about worship is it takes the focus off yourself. Mm -hmm. And in the religious practice, it puts it onto God. But, mm -hmm. but like when you go to a concert too, you're not really thinking about yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You're thinking about what's going the music and you immerse yourself in that. And so our, our, folk, our culture is so self-focused mm -hmm. and what you were saying kind of about being on the phone and it's all about you and all about your social media and likes and all of those things, if you live up and it's all about comparison. And so music for one minute <laughs> takes, takes that off. And yeah. I think that's what, what you're referring to kind of is, um, you know, that's the beautiful part about music. And I, I think our, our culture um, will be much healthier or people will be much healthier when we can bring live music back. Yeah, absolutely. After a year of zoom, I'm tired of looking at my own face and the idea of <laughs> not being this. Um, I would say we've got uh, three minutes left and I'd love to have, um, that was a great closer for you, Laura, unless you have anything else, but Shannon and Ken, if you wanna like wrap it up with some sort of closing comments. Shannon, do you wanna go first? Um, <laughs> sure, and Storm's, tell Storm's telling us we have five minutes, but oh, um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just a couple kind of random thoughts, I guess. I. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about, to your comment earlier, Ken, um, how you are talking to people when you're like at the store picking up things. But I think a lot of us have lost our ability to kind of like just interact with people. And I'm thinking about like the first concert or the, you know, the first thing and that music can help us relearn how to be together. Um, because at its core, it's a communal experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what it kind of, teaches us and shows us yeah yeah no, I, I agree it's the it's 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 much more physical than it is cerebral it's not just the intellectual thing of you know uh, keeping your distance and wearing your mask and wa washing your hands it's about not thinking about these things and dancing together listening to music and really as laura put it wonderfully like not thinking about yourself but putting the focus on the dance floor or the music, or or whatever whatever it is, and so that's very that's very we're all missing that part. I think we're all very uh, uh, self obsessed right now with our own health, with our own safety, with our own little world, and it's 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 going to be a glorious time when we can get back to that um, sweaty um, beer filled uh, music venue. So uh. right, I've got I've got such a sense of like I have this daydream that I walk into my favorite venue and I see all the people that I adore that I haven't seen or allowed myself to think about even. And, you know, the people that you know well and the people that you know not so well, but you always dig when you see them. And just like that, that daydream has helped me kind of process these moments when I'm not in that space. So I look forward to the actual manifestation of that. And and it does, it, it feeds every part. It feeds your physical, your spiritual, your mental, your emotional. It's the whole package. And I can think of few things that do it that much except maybe ch church you know it's like it's 
it's the whole thing. And I think it's gonna be central um, to our collective recovery. And Laura, you do end up having time. Bring it on home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, so much pressure. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just encourage anyone out there that's listening that you know has had a tough year or is just living on the edge, right? And just know that there is hope. Um, and I think we're all here to be an encouragement and to say like, we see it'll get better. We'll get back out there. Um, I'm just going to give a plug for the onsite foundation. If anybody is feeling overwhelmed or needs mental health resources, the onsite foundation.org, please reach out. We're here to help. Um, and music is a part of our workshop. So that's, that's great. But, uh, just want to give hope to, to people that are out there that are feeling in the dark place right now. You're totally normal. You're human. And we've all been there. Um, so there's no no shame uh, in reaching out to ask for help. Yeah. And I, since we have a little time, I just wanted to bring up, you know, one other thing is that, you know, musicians, we need to think about the musicians' me mental health as well. And I know you weren't excluding them, Laura, but, you know, they've been without their lifeblood in some ways, being in front of a crowd, being with a crowd. For, for a long time as well. And so I just wanted to kind of make that that note of like, this isn't just what musicians, how musicians can help others heal, but they, they also need um, these so things as well. Really good point. So um, those in creative industries are three times more likely to suffer from mental health uh, problems and issues. So there's a, whole, there's a lot of research behind that, but one of the programs we do at the Onsite Foundation is focused um, strictly on those in creative fields. And that includes art and music, dance, et cetera. So um, that's a program that we do. You're exactly right. And this year has been really tough on those groups. So thanks for acknowledging that. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm the unwitting moderator. But thanks, for everybody, for listening. And thanks, all of you beautiful people, for speaking. This has been such a great conversation. I want to tell you that there's so much that has resonated with the audience, the collective effervescence and and so many of the th things you said, people were repeating in the chat. So, so really appreciate the conversation and, and sharing us such great resources, et cetera. So, all right. Well, uh, thank you all again, panelists. We appreciate you. And we will be back soon in about two and a half minutes with our next panel.